going to need the Holy Spirit to help us as we navigate some of this material today. So, Holy Spirit, please come afresh into our mind and our heart. Illuminate the word to us, Lord, because we just struggle sometimes to really make a good decision as to the interpretation and understanding of things. So I pray, Lord, make it clear to us in a way that we couldn't comprehend with our natural man. Just be with each and every one of us today as we study your word in your wonderful name. Amen. Amen. So just to summarise where we have been, we have been looking at eschatology, the study of end times, and we finished looking through Matthew 24, which is a lot of the information that Jesus gave about what's going to happen at the end. But many people stop at 24 and don't keep reading into chapter 25. Mm -hmm. Chapter 24 and 25 are all the same talk. So we started on the parable of the ten virgins, which is in Matthew 25, verse 1. So that's where we're up to. I'll just read the text to begin with, to refresh our memory. So we're looking in Matthew 25, verse 1 to 13. 25, 1 to 13. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps, but while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Quite a difficult passage of scripture to interpret. As I said last week, you could almost write a book on this parable because there are many theological truths in here and interpreting them from parables is a challenge and we always have to restrict ourselves to the symbolism that comes out of scripture. So I'm just gonna summarize what I did last week to bring it back into your mind. We can't just pluck interpretations out, like I think the virgins are this, I think the oil's that, and you imagine something. The Word of God interprets itself, so therefore we need to see what the Word says about the lamp, the light, the oil, the virgins, the marriage, and so forth. So last week I covered fairly extensively what an ancient wedding involves. The betrothal of the virgin, so in other words, the two families and the fathers would come together, they would discuss the purchase of the bride, they'd come to some sort of agreement on the price, the price would be paid, the virgin would go away back to her father's house, stay there, she was to remain celibate and committed to her husband. Back then, this betrothal was as if marriage like for us today. Then the groom would go off and he would prepare a place where he's going to live. You prepare for the bride. And then at an appointed time, he would come and receive the bride back to himself. And how I talked about this is a, a beautiful image of what Jesus has done for us. He has purchased us as his bride with his blood. He has returned to his Father in heaven, preparing a place for us. And the day will come that he will return and take us, his bride, to be with him where he is. So this process also helps give understanding in a pictorial way to what's called the doctrine of sanctification. I covered all this last week. Positional sanctification is that you have the right position with God. Even Paul, when he said, O wretched man that I am, uh, who will deliver me from this body of sin? He went on to say, therefore, now there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Even the apostle Paul went back to his position in Christ when he struggled with his sin. So we always have that position. So salvation is not dependent upon us being sinless. It's not dependent upon us becoming Christians and then never sinning again. That would be impossible and all of you know that. 
So therefore, uh, our position is that we are saved by grace through faith in Christ. That he died on the cross and paid the price for our sin through his shed blood and through his body given as a sacrifice. So therefore, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ and you are baptised into Christ and you live for Christ, so therefore being in Christ becomes the position. I am saved because of my position with Christ through the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. That does not excuse us then from what I'd consider the bad teaching of hyper grace, which is I've now been saved, so therefore I can go and do whatever I like and there is no sense of which God requires anything of me. That is a poor teaching and an incomplete gospel. When a person gives their life fully to Jesus Christ, they are called to consecration, they are called to sanctification. This is the picture of the bride that is purchased by the uh, betrothal cost, which is the betrothal cost Jesus paid with his blood. But then she is to remain committed as married to her husband, yet not consummated in that relationship because she's not actually with her husband yet. The same picture for us. We've been purchased by Jesus' blood. We are therefore to live a consecrated, sanctified life, waiting for his return. And so all of these parables in Matthew 25 are talking about this. They're all talking about, are you ready for the return of Christ? Are you ready for the groom to come and get you? He's already purchased you with his blood. You already have a position with Jesus Christ. So now consecrate your life, work with the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to produce sanctification in your life so that when he does come, you are ready. So I also talked about the lamp. Um, we started talking about the lamp and I'll give it a bit more today. So one of the key verses for the lamp is Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. The Bible teaches us that the symbol of the lamp is the word the, and we know that Jesus Christ was the word incarnate and also that we reveal that word through a sanctified transformed life so there are many levels to which this applies but at the most basic level is the word of God the Bible becomes the lamp but that lamp is of no use unless, unless it has oil in it and it is still of no use until you light the oil so the lamp the oil the fire all come together to produce light your word is a lamp unto my path, oh, sorry, a light, a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. It can only produce light once it has oil in it. It can only produce light once it is lit. So therefore the word of God, illuminated by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit being the uh, oil, representative of the oil. So the lamp, the word of God, the oil of the Holy Spirit set on fire, um, which is obedience to that word in the power of the Holy Spirit shines a light. So then it comes in multiple ways. I am only summarising what we did last week. Here's the lamp. The lamp is illuminated by the Holy Spirit the oil. It is set on fire by the action of obedience to that word. Then your life also becomes a lamp because the word of God abides in you and you become a like a living testimony, a representation of that revelation to the world. I think that'll do. Let's pick up where we're up to, which is verse 2. So we're up to verse 2. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Foolish translated from the Greek comes from the word moros, which is where we get the word moron. So in other words, five were wise and five were morons. <laughs> in our language, I think that paints a better picture. Because foolish, foolish was more the word they would use back then, but being a moron is the word we would more understand. Like, like this is just, in other words, it is moronic that you would behave like this. Are you such a fool? So, but then the wise virgins, and we need to distinguish what is the difference between those who are wise and those who are foolish. In verse 3, those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. Now, one of the things that we're going to have to work out in this parable is this verse seems to slightly contradict another verse in the parable. So I'm just going to, in your notes or in your thoughts, just highlight this. Because this verse goes, those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. Now, does that mean they took no oil in the lamps or they took the other bit, they didn't take the other vessel which had the extra oil or more oil? If you just read this one, it seems to indicate, and looking at the original language as well, it seems to indicate that they had no oil. 
but later on it becomes a problem because it says their lamps were going out. That's right. Yep. So that's why I'm highlighting it here. People can unfortunately think they don't have oil. This is where if you don't believe a person can lose their salvation and you believe salvation is assured once a person commits their life to Jesus Christ and not for me, but I'm going to say it, and they say the sinner's prayer, that they're saved and can't lose their salvation, then people who believe that struggle with this parable, and they, every person who believes that, I cannot hear them explain in terms of doctrine or understanding how they get around this issue. These virgins who were foolish morons had oil in their lamps, but they ran out of oil, and as a result of running out of oil, they went off somewhere to try and get the oil, and you can't buy the oil. The picture is they went off into town to buy the oil, but as we know, you can't buy the Holy Spirit. You can't get it from a marketplace, get him from a marketplace. So therefore, they ran out, and they were off doing something else. Then he came, they were not ready, and then they knocked on the door, and he said, I do not know you. So if we believe that a person has the lamp, which is the Word of God, the oil, which is the Spirit of God, and that lamp is lit, which means the Holy Spirit has illuminated this word to them, and they are called virgins, and they are called brides, that in all cases, if you just look at the text itself and the way it's interpreted, these people, I believe, were Christian. Now, if you can find a good theological argument as to how you can say they're not, Please um, come and chat with me or send me an email or give me some verses because I've been searching and searching. I've gone to all the people who believe, uh, Calvinists who believe once saved, always saved, but they have very strict guidelines on salvation. This is the problem. This becomes the problem because I use language that I know in Christian circles means something different. So once saved, always saved. I'm talking about fully saved, properly saved. Not, not somebody who has a superficial understanding of Jesus Christ and said some sinner's prayer. They have no idea what they're doing. They haven't given their life to Christ. They haven't weighed up the cost. They haven't been baptised. They haven't been filled with the Spirit. They're not living for Jesus. They're not sanctified. They're not consecrated. No fruit, no evidence. Okay, so you get the picture. It's a bit more than just once saved, always saved. I'm talking about somebody who's truly saved because in this parable... They had all the indications of salvation. They had the oil, they had the lamp, they had the Holy Spirit. Um, they were virgins, they had the robes. Everything about them indicated they were virgins. So let's make sure that we agree, first of all, that oil represents the Holy Spirit or the anointing oil. So I'm going to give you a few verses and we'll go through a few for this. There are over 200 references to oil and the use of oil in Scripture. I didn't look at all 200, but I picked out a few. Exodus chapter 29, verse 21. Exodus chapter 29, verse 21. You may actually want to turn to this because there's a very interesting piece of information in this one. Exodus 29, verse 21. Okay, Exodus 29, verse 21. And you shall take some of the blood that is on the altar and some of the anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aaron and on his garments, on his sons and on the garments of his sons with him. And he and his garments shall be hallowed, and his sons and his sons' garments with him. Now, let's just pick up all the symbolization that appears here. Remembering that quite a lot of things that were done in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, especially with regard to the tabernacle and to the priestly garments and so forth, were all symbolic of the fulfilment that came in Jesus Christ. So what we're looking for in this is, obviously he, the, the word is quite clear, they were not truly sanctified with the shedding of blood because they had to come back year after year, day after day, sacrifice after sacrifice. And in Hebrews it clearly teaches they were not, sin was not actually remitted through the shedding of this blood. All of the work that they did in the Old Covenant was prophetic towards the fulfilment in Jesus Christ. He is the one and only true sacrifice which is capable of, of being, uh, shedding his blood for the remission of our sins, for the true, true remission of our sins. It's not like we have to do anything else to gain forgiveness. Jesus Christ's blood has cleansed us from our sin. It is gone. Past, present and future, he has dealt with it through his blood. All those in the Old Testament who looked forward 
to the Messiah, to the shed blood, and have faith in Hebrews. The Old Testament saints have faith. And us who look back to Jesus' death on the cross through the testimony of the apostles. So everybody having faith in Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You get salvation nowhere else. No one in the Old Covenant was saved by obeying the law. So the anointing oil. So if you have a look at some of the symbolism, you shall take some of the blood that was on the altar. Now obviously this represents take some of the blood of Jesus Christ as the fulfilment of this. So the, so the blood applied to our life and some of the anointing oil and sprinkle on an Aaron. And we're going to come to other verses that clearly show this anointing oil is the anointing of the Holy Spirit, symbolic of that. So you take the blood of Jesus Christ and the oil of the Holy Spirit and here we go. Here's the picture of how this works. That the truth of Jesus Christ shed blood on the cross for the remission of sins becomes empowered by the Holy Spirit. People see the truth as the Holy Spirit takes away the blindness and the darkness and reveals the truth of Jesus Christ to them. So the work of the Holy Spirit and the work of the blood bringing sanctification. But also notice that he sprinkled it on Aaron's garments and on his son's garments, which is the same picture that we see in Revelation, the, uh, the, the martyrs who, who had the white robes. And it says in Scripture, the white robes washed in the blood of the Lamb. So back here in Exodus 29, 21, we have a symbolic understanding of the blood, the anointing oil, and the cleansed garments. So all of this indicates through the blood of Jesus Christ, the work of the Holy Spirit, we become sanctified in Jesus Christ. This is symbolic of the blood of Jesus and the oil of the Holy Spirit. In Exodus chapter 30, verse 22, you probably don't have to turn to this one, Exodus 30, 22 to 23, um, is where the command to make and use the anointing oil is. I'm not going to read it if you just want to take note it down. Exodus 30, 22 to 33. The one I am going to look at, though, you might want to turn to is 1 Samuel, chapter 16, verse 13. 1 Samuel 16, 13. 1 Samuel, chapter 16, verse 13. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. Clear reference, the prophet anointed David with the oil. And from that day forward, the Spirit of God, or the Spirit of the Lord, was upon David. So we have a clear, solid easily interpreted and understood verse that indicates that anointing oil or oil represents the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 4 verse 18. Luke chapter 4 verse 18. This is Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. So there you go, the Spirit of the Lord and anointing. Luke chapter 4 verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Jesus himself, as we know from his baptism, when he came up out of the waters of baptism, the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. And in one of the Gospels it says the Holy Spirit remained with him. And from that point forward is where we have recorded testimony of miraculous work. Now that doesn't mean that Jesus in his divinity didn't or couldn't do miraculous work before the baptism. It is more likely that he in submission to the Father and obedience to him waited until that because when John the Baptist said, you know, far be it from me to baptize you, you know, you should be baptizing me. And he said, let it be done for now for all righteousness or for righteousness sake. In other words, it's the right thing to do. So Jesus had to set the example. So he withheld miraculous power that he could have done from his own substance as divine. Remember, we've gone through this many times that Jesus is God incarnate, fully God, fully man. He could have done all that he did while filled with the Holy Spirit, while the Holy Spirit was with him, he could have done all of that himself. But he waited in righteousness for things to be done according to the will of the Father for a pattern, for an understanding, because remember, he is also fully human, which means he needed to demonstrate to us that we cannot serve the Lord fully. We cannot serve the Lord obediently unless we have the work of the Holy Spirit active in our life. 
He was able to because he was Jesus Christ. He resisted sin and temptation in a way that uh, we just can't. He was faced with the same temptation that we were, and yet he resisted all that sin and committed no sin. And we need to fully understand that Jesus was truly and really tempted like we are, which means he had the same nature. If Jesus did not have the same nature, then he is not a suitable substitutionary sacrifice. He has to be one of us, and he was fully one of us, so he was fully human, which means, which is just incredible. This is why when I look at Jesus' life, <laughs> pray, Jesus, you live this life with the same nature as us and sinned not. <laughs> God. <laughs> that in itself is enough to show that Jesus Christ was God incarnate. Yeah, he could do what we couldn't. But it is baptism. And so he was anointed to do these things. So there's clear verses there that the anointing, this oil, is the Holy Spirit. So the conclusion of these symbols that I've been through is that the lamp is a vessel that holds the oil of the Spirit, which in turn, once lit, gives light. There's the Word of God, which I've talked about as a vessel, but there's also us as a vessel. And this is one of the great things about parables. Parables where Jesus said, um, you know, the lamp, the oil, so forth, has multiple meanings revealed in Scripture. So instead of going, instead of Jesus saying, you know, the, the Word of God, you know, you as a believer, and unpacking all that that meant, he, could, he was able to just say, the oil and the lamp. And bang, it means all of this once you start to study other Scripture. So if you turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16... I'm going to move a little faster. That's, yeah, look, turn to 1 Corinthians because the next one's in Corinthians as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? So here's another lamp. If the Spirit of God dwells in us, we too are a lamp. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. So those who missed the first one, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Then jump down to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 to 20. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So this is where we start to get that idea where people struggle about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Because if you are joined to the Lord, you are one spirit with the Lord. If you are saved... You have the Spirit of Christ. If you do not have the Spirit of Christ, you do not have the Lord. You cannot be saved without the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy, Holy Spirit has to illuminate. The Holy Spirit has to work in us. We are connected and joined to the Lord through and by the power of the Holy Spirit in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, being baptized into Christ. So you need to probably listen to last Sunday's sermon to get more understanding of that. One of, just, to, just to give you a hint. Many people misunderstand the work of the Holy Spirit because they see the work of the Holy Spirit as an event. The symbolism for the Holy Spirit are things like wind, fire, water. The nature, the nature of all of those things is that it's dynamic. Fire can be raging. Fire can be quiet. You know, the water can trickle. The water can flood. The wind can be a breeze. The wind can be a tornado. The Holy Spirit is dynamic in his nature. So these, these symbols indicate to us the nature of the Holy Spirit is dynamic. So therefore it is no contradiction to say that the Holy Spirit is in us for salvation and then to say we need a second blessing or the fullness of the Holy Spirit to be baptised in the Holy Spirit. And the command from Paul is even be, be continually filled. It was a command. Don't just receive the Holy Spirit once. Be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. So therefore the nature of the work of the Holy Spirit in our life is dynamic. It is not an event. Whereas salvation, you can cross the line into positional sanctification. When you get to that place where you have true saving faith in Jesus Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit is there and you put faith in Christ and you're baptised, you can come into a position where I'm saved and you can look back at that and say, I was saved then. But you can't do that with the Holy Spirit because if then the Holy Spirit worked in you for salvation. He was working in you before that to bring you to salvation. He's working in you after that to sanctify your life. He's working in you after that to fill you with the power of the Holy Spirit for ministry. The work of the Holy Spirit is dynamic. That's not what this sermon is, so they get off track, probably. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 6, 17. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Because of this, 
flee sexual immorality. Everything that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Listen to what he's saying here. You have been purchased. The purchase price has been paid. The bride owns you. When the bride's coming back for you, he's paid for you already. And when he comes back, he expects you to be ready. He expects you to be there doing what's supposed to be done, which is to be sanctified, to be consecrated, to be set apart, waiting for Jesus and doing what is required of us here while we wait. Sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, working in holiness. So therefore, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? So therefore, flee sexual immorality. This is what I've said before, and I, I get mixed up which Saturday or Sunday, so I'll say it again. What tears many Christians apart is when they live in the world and try to live in the spirit. Live in the flesh and live in the spirit. Commit sexual immorality and then come to church and praise God. That is an absolute contradiction and that will tear your soul apart. You need to repent of the sin, consecrate your life unto Jesus Christ and understand you have been purchased with his blood. God the Father in Jesus Christ sent his son. God did all he could. And the pain and suffering and rejection and even setting aside his glory in heaven to come to earth in the first place. I can tell you, when we get back there we, in, in John 17, he desires us to be with him where he is to see the glory he had before the foundation of the world. When we get there and we see this glory, we'll say, how on earth did you leave that to come for us? How? How did you do that? None of us would do that. God loved the world so much that he gave. God, we, we will never comprehend what Jesus has actually given until we see the glory, until we see the holiness. And, and it'll just, oh Lord, how on earth did you leave the Father, leave heaven, leave the glory and come and take on flesh for us? How did you do that? Glory be to God. Praise be to Jesus. Never stop praising the Lord and understand what he has done for us. We had no hope apart from Jesus Christ. What could we do? We couldn't do better works to come to heaven. We can't make ourselves better in God's eyes. A wretched man that I am, I know how evil I am. And I know how evil I would be if it wasn't for the work of the word of the Lord in my life. My flesh would just consume me in its lust and pride and passion and rebellion and selfishness and greed and everything else that lives in my flesh. I, no hope of salvation. The only future we would ever have is, is judgment and condemnation. And as we know, when Jesus comes to judge those who are, do not have faith in Jesus Christ and do not have salvation, you will be judged for your work and the result will you will be placed in hell. Sin causes you to be judged and placed in hell, which is the just re reward for your work as a sinner. All of us are in that position without Christ. So therefore, no one can sit in pride and arrogance above another person and say, I judge you. No. Humble yourself. Get the log out of your own eye. You're a dreadful sinner. All you can do is praise God. He has saved me and he's come from heaven for me. Hallelujah. Jesus. Because there is no other way than the blood of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. Amen. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, so therefore flee sexual immorality in you whom from God you have not, and you are not your own, for you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Do what is necessary for anyone here or anyone listening who's struggling with sexual immorality. Do whatever is necessary to flee sexual immorality. It is a sin against the body, the temple of the Holy Spirit. Verse 4. Oh, I'm making a bit of progress today. <laughs> I forgot to turn my timer on, so you'll have to keep track of me. Well. <laughs> Verse 4. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. So this is a vessel separate to the lamp. This is like another vessel. <coughs> Verse 8. Did the foolish virgins have any oil in their lamps? Had they gone out, or could they not be lit? Right. Now, I think the best way to interpret this is they were lit. And it says that they were going out. 
This proves a problem for interpreting the text. The only difference between the two is the extra oil in the vessel and that the foolish moronic virgins went off to the market to try and buy oil while they were supposed to be ready. So they were off doing something else instead of what they were supposed to be doing because they ran out of oil and they went to some weird place to try and get that oil. If all had the oil to begin with, then the foolish virgins used up what they had, which is symbolic of losing salvation. Now, I've got a heap of verses I'm about to come into. I'm not going to cover all this doctrine, but I want to give you at least some and we'll see how we go, because it is fairly important to understand this. Because one of the unfortunate problems, if you combine two things together, a poor preaching of the gospel, which is to say the sinner's prayer in order to be saved, with the idea that you cannot lose your salvation, and bring those two things together, we have millions of Christians who think that they are going to enter the kingdom of heaven. And the parable is quite clear where Jesus said they came and said, Lord, Lord. And he said, I do not know you. Depart from me, you practices of, of lawlessness or wickedness. So therefore, this is where I talk all the time. True salvation, a full gospel, leads to a transformed life, a sanctified life. That doesn't mean we're perfect, but you look at your life and say, yes, Jesus, by the Holy Spirit and through the Word, is transforming my life. Hallelujah. I'll never reach perfection because the doctrine is to help you understand it. Positional sanctification. If you ever mess up, you go back to the position. Lord, forgive me. Your shed blood. Help me. What do I have to do? Then take seriously what you need to do to be progressively sanctified. And then final sanctification at the return of the Lord. So understand that doctrine clearly. But this teaches, I believe, that I don't believe there's any way out of it. That I've tried, I've listened, I've looked, I've studied. I cannot find an interpretation of this in the opposite to the idea that we lose our salvation. People who believe you can't lose your salvation have never dealt with this in a way that is, I believe, solid. So I'm going to give you a few quotes, first of all, from Dr. James White. So you can look him up online. He's a, an apologist. He's, um, he's done extensive work. I think this is a James White who read all the, through all, and I mean all, he took I think five years off and just read and read all the early church father writing and teachings so that he could get a solid, clear understanding because what the Calvinists, if you want the word Calvinist, are the ones who teach once saved, always saved. And Calvinism comes more from the early church father's teaching. So he uh, extensively studied that and what, what the problem is, is there are progressions of people's understanding and different schools of thought. And of course people cherry pick what they want and so the Calvinists pick out the people who support Calvinism. But if you want more you need to go and listen to some of Dr White's uh, comments. So I'm going to give you some today. But the first one, uh, if you're taking notes you could look at Look at Psalm 135, verse 6. Just take these down. I'm not going to go to these. Psalm 135, verse 6. Daniel, chapter 4, verse 34 to 35. And Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 10 to 11. Okay, the first comment that he has made, which I would agree with, I do not believe in once saved, always saved. That is too ambiguous. How does one become saved? Is asking Jesus into your heart having, or having good feelings or believing in a few things about Jesus enough? This is where the clarity of the gospel needs to be solid. And somebody has asked me, well, you've deconstructed it how I understand to share the gospel with people. Can you now give me something? So I'm working on a little sort of a sheet like folded in half like this with sort of unpacking the gospel so people can use it as a more complete way of understanding how to lead people to Christ. I'm in the middle of working on it. It will come out. 
But so, you know, you have a few good feelings. You go to a Pentecostal church and you pray and, oh, I feel the Holy Spirit, which you may or may not do, whether that's the Holy Spirit or the evil spirit, I don't know. You feel something. You might feel moved by the music. Who knows? Right? But you feel something. Does that mean you're saved? Right? So you believe a few key things about Jesus, like, yes, Jesus died on the cross for my sins, you know, or, or yes, Jesus was a sinless good man. It, it, uh, you know, how much do you have to believe? And is it just believing in something that causes salvation? See, so the, so the comment, once saved, always saved, becomes too ambiguous. What do you actually mean by that? So here we're going to look a little bit more deeply at what this actually means. First thing to note, there is a difference between those who profess to be Christians and those who are elect. A difference between those who profess to be Christians and those who are elect. Now, there's many parables, many stories where there are professing Christians who shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. I think there's a title of a sermon up just recently on YouTube about that. Not all professing Christians will go to heaven. We're back to the same verse. Those who call me Lord, Lord, shall not. I don't know who you are. So just declaring or professing Jesus Christ is not enough. There are many people who will do that and not enter in. You need to be elect. Now, some people don't like the word elect because it paints this picture that we are elected or chosen by God, but what about all the people who aren't chosen? So, that, so there's number one issue that we need to overcome because the word says God desires all men everywhere to be saved. So if he desires all to be saved, why aren't all saved? But then if it's not by a person's decision to believe and their profession of faith, but rather the election that God in Christ, you know, they are elected, which I'm about to show you in the scripture, they are chosen for salvation, elected for salvation. And if you look up the word elect through the New Testament, you'll see it appear quite often. And that was the way the apostles began to define this gift of salvation. Those who are elect, those who are called and chosen for salvation. Now, for Calvinists, what this means is they go to the root of our total depravity, what's called total depravity, that in our fallenness, in our wretchedness, we have nothing within us that can respond to the glory of God. Nothing in us that can respond to the message of Jesus Christ. We are totally depraved. That's what that teaching uh, understands. So therefore, there's nothing within me that can respond. So therefore, they teach that only those who are elect, chosen by the Father, can respond. And he gives them some form of unction or ability in the Holy Spirit to respond to the gospel message. Now, I'm not going to, I might give you some of my opinions towards the end. I just want you to understand the complexity of the issue. The next uh, point to consider is if you are a synergist, a synergist is you believe that there are multiple factors and forces at play in a person's conversion or salvation. So, a synergist, a synergist believes there are multiple forces at play in a person's salvation. So, things like you have the election or the work of the Holy Spirit in, in your life. God is revealing himself to you. God is drawing. You add to that my free will that I'm choosing. You add to that the obedience of someone to actually share the message with me. You add to that the circumstances of my life. You know, there are some people who never get to hear the gospel. So a sinner just believes that there are multiple things at play in a person's conversion. So you need to work out, are you a synergist or a monogist? A monogist is a person who believes you are saved by the power of God, you're elect. So God the Father elects you, chooses you and gives you to Jesus Christ. So therefore, don't worry, all the people that are going to be saved will be saved because they're elect. Now they're the two extremes, and as I often find with extremes, the balance is somewhere in the middle. So is salvation the work of God's kingly freedom, which is monogism, so God's kingly freedom, or is it a cooperative effort subject to failure, which is synergism? See, so the reason that Calvinists believe you can't lose your salvation is because they believe it is a sole sovereign act of God. And there are many scriptures to support that view. So what this means is God is, for, let me explain this a little bit. The problem of God chooses us, elects us, reveals So in other words, I'm destined to be saved because I'm one of the elect. Now, some people have trouble because what about all the people who aren't saved? But that is actually not a problem. Because people who ask that question come from the basis of we deserve to be saved. 
None of us deserve to be saved. All of us deserve the fires of hell. So when you understand that, then it's not a problem for God to choose people out of that and elect them. Whoa, that is so against the culture of our day. If you go up to someone, and this is why the gospel has changed, if you go up to someone and ask them, do you believe you're a good person? 99.9% of people will say yes. So I'm a good person, so salvation is about a good God giving good things to me as a good person. And if you turn around and say, well, no, you're a depraved sinner destined for hell. No, 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 stop, stop, stop. No, no, you, no, 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 I'm a good person. God loves me. He loves everything I'm doing, everything's okay. He loves me just the way I am. So people who think that way and people who have come into Christianity without a full understanding of their sinful nature, their total depravity, and they've come into salvation and they have a, a weak view of their own wretchedness, then this becomes a problem because they say, aren't we basically good? Aren't we created in God's image? Shouldn't a good God save us all? But Calvinists would say, no, he is under no obligation or requirement to save anybody. If he acted completely justly and wholly, he could return now and send everybody to hell. You know, without Jesus, I'm talking about. So therefore, the problem for, for most people becomes, well, hold on a minute. Why did God pick me? Why is it that I can know the Lord? Why is it that I can see Jesus? And this is where the problem comes, because there is a degree to which I believe in election. Um, because, it, because it answers the problem of God desires all men everywhere to be saved. Of course, he doesn't want anyone in hell. He, never, he doesn't want that. But just because God doesn't want something, he's also created us in such a way that we have free will. But is, is it our free will that causes us to reject the message and end up in, heaven, in hell? Or is it that all of us are going to hell and God, out of his love and grace, he lets some for salvation so that he'll have some with him in the kingdom of heaven? You need to work that out a little bit because there are sound theologians at both ends. That's why this parable is a problem. Because if the virgins have the oil to begin with, it means they can lose it. But if God elects people, how does he lose them? If, if, if it's by sovereign election, how can he then lose them? This, you can go online and listen to endless debates over this issue. I'm only raising it for you to understand what the problem is. John chapter 6, verse 37. John chapter 6, verse 37. This is probably, by the looks of it, a text that supports Calvinism. Verse 37 to 40. All that the Father gives me will come to me. All that the Father gives me will come to me. This is where I preach, and it's quite clear in the text, the Father gives us to Jesus Christ. All the Father gives me will come to me. John chapter 6, verse 37. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. So when you take 37 in isolation by itself, it appears that the Father elects us, gives us to Jesus Christ, and Jesus by no means will cast us out. So this seems to read assurance of salvation, that if you are in Christ Jesus, all that the Father gives me will come to me. Yes. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Yes. This for me in no way contradicts the idea that when you are in Christ, you cannot be lost. And to be in Christ, that the Father needs to reveal Jesus to you. And he does that by the work of the Holy Spirit. There's no way around this idea that you cannot come to salvation unless you have the blindness taken away. Because remember, everybody who is unsaved is under the power of Satan in the darkness of the world and how, and the light shone in that darkness, but the darkness did not comprehend it. So how can the darkness comprehend the light? Jesus said that even when he came into the world, the darkness could not comprehend it. So the same applies to us. If we're in outer darkness under the work of Satan, then the light comes, we can't even comprehend it. So there is a degree to which we cannot be saved unless the Father elects us, and all that the Father gives them to Jesus, he will by no means cast out. So one of the key verses, if, you, if it's bending your mind too much, just remember this phrase, we are saved because we are in Christ. So that's a key understanding. And the apostles wrote it that way, they preached it that way. You are saved by being in Christ. Not believing, 
like, because you can pluck texts out of context and say, he who believes shall not die but have eternal life. And if you pluck that out without any other scripture, it seems like if I just have some sort of mental ascension to the existence of Jesus, I'm going to be saved. All right, that's not what scripture teaches. You have to be, believe, you cannot end up in Christ unless you believe. You have to have belief in Jesus as God incarnate, as the suitable sacrifice sufficient for you. That yes, you get that supernatural revelation. And so this is one of the things I'm really struggling to put on this sheet about how does the gospel work? Because one of the key ingredients that a lot of people miss is that you can't do this yourself. So people who are desperate, they're desperate for, I need help, I need food, I need friendship, I need whatever. You know, they've got needs and they come to Jesus and they see, what do I have to do? I have to do this. But there's no supernatural revelation to Christ. There's no supernatural revelation that's come to their sin and their need for Christ and salvation. The salvation has not come. Salvation is a born again experience. It's a supernatural experience. You can't argue a person into the kingdom of God. You can't convince a person. Now, arguing convincing needs to happen, but you understand that in itself will not lead someone to Christ. It's a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. There has to be an element of which God reveals, because in outer darkness we cannot comprehend the truth. So therefore, yes. Now, I do believe you can... Oh, let's just put it out there. You know, you need to make up your own mind. I, I do believe you can lose your salvation, but I don't believe you can lose your salvation through sinning. Because otherwise, which sin? Where? Now, there are some that seem to indicate when you get into severe sexual immorality that, that that's more questionable. But I still have the problem of how far can you go in your sin because Jesus died for my sin past, present and future. So therefore, it can't be sin or else all of us are in trouble. That's the reality of it. Question mark comes over extreme sin, but once a person gets into extreme sin, there's a good chance that they've walked away from Christ. You know, I'm talking about stuff that you and I just couldn't even imagine. You know? But as I've said before, sin will take you to the point where you look at your faith in Christ, your sin in the world, and you are torn apart. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And then it becomes, which way am I going to go? And you can find many people who once believed solidly and had fruit of, and evidence of salvation and through whatever circumstances in their life have got to the point where they say, I don't actually believe in Jesus anymore. I don't believe he's real. I don't believe he died on the cross. I believe this is all just fantasy um, and become like atheists or agnostics or something like that. Once you are no longer in Christ, you no longer have salvation. The key phrase is in Christ. That's why it is extremely dangerous. And that's what all these parables are about, is do not be so foolish to think that you cannot do this yourself. Don't be so foolish to think that you can indulge in graphic sin, unrepented sin, have an unconsecrated life, doing all manner of wickedness and lawlessness, and think that you are not risking your salvation. Be sanctified, be consecrated, be progressively sanctified, work at your salvation, pay attention to it. Do not leave it, you leave your salvation idle, what were they doing? They were sleeping, they had no extra oil, they were not attending to their faith and the world consumed them and the oil, they ran out of oil. I believe that that's what this parable does teach. I, I can't find any way around it. And I do that deliberately because, you know, there's people who hate this idea that you can lose your salvation because all of a sudden what that does is, is put a sense of responsibility back on us. And that can be a bit frightening because... But the responsibility isn't... You can't do this. Remember that. If we were able to make ourselves consecrated and sanctified and perfected, well, then Jesus never would have died on the cross and he would have required it. We know we can't do that. Jesus died on the cross to make a way. And therefore, what's the fruit? The fruit of the Spirit. And the Word says to walk in the Spirit, not the flesh. So therefore, the Word, Word of God, which is a lamp filled with the Holy Spirit being illuminated to us, transforms our life. This is why I'm so amazed that the power of God's Word, when preached and taught solidly, transforms lives. You know, sometimes we want to go and find um, supernatural experiences and, and, and you see a lot of people do that and I don't know what they're experiencing. Now, don't get me wrong, I believe in the Holy Spirit. I've experienced lots of miraculous things. But if you chase after an experience thinking that that's going to change you, it's not. 
The Word of God, illuminated by the Holy Spirit, brings about a transformed life. So therefore, study the Word and obey the Word, and that will transform your life. John chapter 6, verse 37 to 40. John chapter 6, verse 37 to 40. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up on the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So it is quite clear that if you see the Son of God, you believe in him and you do all that's required, you've been purchased, you're going to have everlasting life. Because your salvation is assured in the power of Jesus' death on the cross. So this is where I think people start to blur and get things mixed up. When you see this, you understand, of course, Jesus is not going to lose any of us. Why? Because his shed blood is the sacrifice able to save us. So if you have faith in Christ, if you're in Christ, you can't be lost because of the power of Jesus' blood. What this is talking about, probably in a fuller context, is especially for the Jews because they, they understood sacrifice, 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 this perpetual requirement. But then Jesus is saying, I am the sacrifice, done, finished. So they needed to understand, hold on, if it's done and finished, do we not need to add something to this? Which comes up later in Galatians and so forth. But they wanted to add circumcision and add works and add things. So as soon as you add something to the gospel, it becomes something other than the gospel. So this was a real difficult moment for them to think that we don't actually have to do anything. It is done in Jesus Christ. Because they, and get me understand what I mean by that. Not There are things we have to do, but for them, they would have been thinking, I don't have to keep sacrificing. I don't have to keep going to the temple. I don't have to circumcise my children. You know, so, so for them, this is like a mind-blowing experience. We just look at it in a completely different context and don't quite get it. But for, for them, for I have come down from heaven, first of all, so therefore he's from heaven, he's incarnate, to do not my will but the Father's will who sent me. So this is the will of God himself. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that all those he has given me, so therefore we are given to Jesus Christ, all those he has given me, I should lose nothing but should raise it up on the last day. Now, I don't think you can limit that to the apostles and disciples of the time during Jesus' life on earth, which is a way some people could sort of explain this away and say, yes, he never lost any of them. Did he not lose any of them? The All right, okay. See, so we have a problem. You, you can't take this text and say what he was talking about was his apostles and disciples that Jesus actually saw while he was alive and he didn't lose any of them. It obviously doesn't mean that because, in a sense, he did. So what this is saying is all those who the Father gives me, so therefore, you know, you'd have to then question... I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. Judas' salvation, was he given to Jesus? Was he a false disciple and all the rest of it? I believe he was a false convert, fulfilling the will of the Father. This is where God in his sovereignty can use all things and he used Judas. Someone had to betray him. Someone had to fulfill the prophecy. But that's a different sermon for a different day. But this verse clearly teaches we are given to Jesus by the Father. And once given to Jesus, he cannot lose us. That is true. But remember the understanding, if you are in Christ, you cannot be lost. So Satan cannot steal you. Um, you cannot be sort of plucked out by somebody else. The only thing that can happen is if you get to the point where you no longer believe in Jesus for salvation. Because by faith you are saved through grace. You lose your faith, you lose your grace. And so therefore, how can you lose grace? By walking away. So don't walk away. That's why it is so dangerous to indulge in sin. But more dangerous than sin, listen to me, more dangerous than sin is worldly thinking. The um, philosophies of this age. Worldly thinking is far more dangerous than a few little sins you might commit. If you start to hear false teaching, and hasn't that, well, I'm not going to criticise too much here, but you know as well as I do, think about all the false teaching you've heard that is seducing millions of Christians into error. False teaching, philosophy of man, 
worldly thinking is far more dangerous because then that all the people I've looked at who have walked away from faith, it's actually more been that. One guy in particular I listened to started listening to atheist people. I wonder why. Why as a Christian would you start reading atheist books? Maybe he thought the first one was to understand atheism so he could speak against it. I don't know. But then when you see the list of books he read, he read far more books about atheism than he did Christianity. And so guess what? The lie got in, the deception got in, and he looked at Christianity and said, that is not true, that is a fairy tale, that is a fantasy, there is no God. And he walked away. And he was actually a preacher who had led many people to Christ. Turning one. So watch what you listen to, watch what you read, watch what you think about. Now don't be so afraid of that that you can't go and study other things. Like I've obviously gone to study Calvinism, Arminianism and different things about Christianity. But watch yourself. If you start to feel yourself slipping, stop. <laughs> Get the word out. Holy Spirit help me and just read. Read. Especially the Gospels because you read Jesus' words and are oh, right, okay, back on track. Watch human philosophy. Okay, that'll do. Let me pray. We're only partway through. What did I get to? Verse 4 or something? <laughs> thank you, Lord. Jesus, I, I really thank you, Lord, that we have your word because we're not left in the dark. So I pray, illuminate our thinking, come Holy Spirit, transform our mind, transform our life. Help us to put this in practice. Help us not to be the moronic virgins but help us to be amongst the wise who are filled with your spirit, have your word, and are ready for you to come and get us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.